Today on Inspired Money. It sounded like the idea of tithing, <laughs> actually, uh, you put it into action at 10 years old. Yeah, pretty, pretty young. I mean, I put it into action, but I never followed through. Cause, I mean, when I was younger, because I... Well, you were 10. Because I ended up buying the Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, but the idea was the seed was there. Eventually, it grew. This is episode two with founder and CEO of Donor C, Gret Glyer. Welcome to Inspired Money. My name is Andy Wong, a managing partner at Runnymede Capital Management. Each week, we bring you an interesting person to help you get inspired, shift your perspectives on money, and achieve incredible things. From making it to giving it away, inspired money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Have you ever walked past a homeless person? I've occasionally given my leftover food to someone in need on the streets of New York, or opened my wallet to give a dollar. Other times, though, I've just kept on walking. What do you do? Our guest today feels compelled to do something bigger and better. He doesn't just think about it. He acts upon it. So much so that his actions have been noticed by venture capitalists. Today I'm talking to Gret Glyer, the founder of Donorcy, an app that lets you help the world's poorest people seconds after downloading, and then shows you the impact of your donation with raw video updates. From 2013 to 16, Gret lived with the world's poorest people in Africa, where he built more than 100 houses for the homeless and crowdfunded $100,000 to build a girls' school in rural Malawi. He's been featured in USA Today, National Review, and the Huffington Post. We talk about doing something more meaningful, his personal life mission, and how different life is living in the third world. I am really excited about this interview. Greta is using technology so all of us can make a meaningful impact on those in need. It's early in the life cycle of his platform, but Gret is someone worth watching in the areas of charity and poverty alleviation. Now let's get inspired, talking to Gret Glyer. Thank you, Gret, for um, joining me today. Really excited to have you on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's just um, jump right in. The first question that I like to start with is, what's your earliest childhood memory of money? Yeah, I think my earliest childhood memory, I was was trying to think about this, and it's kind of an interesting story um, when it comes to like what I do now, but it was pretty early on. I remember I was saving money, like I was, I was saving money for, for church. I was, like, trying to set aside 10% of my allowance, and I was really young, like 10 years old. Wow. And I was sitting in this drawer, and I was, like, saving up money, and I think I saved up, like, 77 bucks, if I remember correctly. And then um, and I was going to, like, donate that to church all at one time. And I'm not sure why I didn't just do it, but um, week after week I would put some money in here. And then at one point, uh, one of my neighbors down the street had – we were selling Pokemon cards and I started buying them like with my, with my regular money. And I like was really in, I was like, Oh, this is so cool. And I wanted to get like, you know, Charizard. I wanted to get like all of the best Pokemon cards. Um, and then eventually like I ran out of my own money <laughs> and instead of, but then I had like this, this reserve that was supposed to be at a church. But I, I remember like stealing from that basically to go buy a bunch of Pokemon cards. And it was at first it was like just a dollar and then it was like five dollars. And then it was like, okay, I'm just going to take the whole thing and buy as many Pokemon cards as I can. Mm-hmm. So yeah, not a flattering first memory of money, but that was, that was the first one. <laughs> yeah. I think there are a lot of lessons in there. <laughs> For sure. Certainly with the Pokemon cards, I think uh, my seven year old son <laughs> yeah. would be, uh, you would be his idol. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> that's probably not a good thing, but thank right. you. <laughs> so tell me, how old are you now? You're a young guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm 27. I turned 27 in March. And I'm impressed that you, it sounded like the idea of tithing, <laughs> actually, uh, you put it into action at 10 years old. Yeah, pretty pretty young. 
I mean, I put into action, but I never followed through. <laughs> I mean, when I was younger, because I... Well, you were 10. Because I ended up buying the book. <laughs> yeah, but the idea, the seed was there. Eventually, it grew. As a personal mission, your website says that you help the poorest people in the world. Can you talk about how you developed that mission? And was there a critical moment when this mission became crystal clear to you? Yeah, so there wasn't like this big conversion experience or anything like that. There was, it was really just um, this gradual thing where I would basically meet, like something would happen, and it was, it was a series of events that would push me closer and closer and closer to this mission. So like one of the first ones uh, that I, I recall a lot is when I was in ninth grade or right before that, my, my family invited me, uh, I mean, we went on a family vacation out to Kenya, and wow. the the goal of the, of the vacation was to like go on safaris and stuff, like really like live it up. I think we did a hot air balloon while we were out there, and we did a whole bunch of cool stuff. But I remember when we first got there, um, I we landed at the airport, and uh, this like taxi cab came and picked up our family and took us to the resort. And when we were driving from the airport to the resort, that was when I saw extreme poverty, it, like in real life for the first time. And you know, there's like people living. It's like dirt floors, people living in shacks, naked kids playing on the side of the road. And um, I saw that, and then we pulled up to the resort doors, and the resort, and the giant, giant walls, like really tall doors, they opened up. Our cab went inside. Some guys opened the door for us. They had, like, these nice warm towels, and we, we uh, you know, washed our hands with them. And that was that was weird because mm-hmm. it was I was I was old enough to realize, like, Wait a second. Something, something about my life is this, this is this is a weird thing. Like I don't I don't think I realized what a lot of people on the planet lived like. And I tried talking to my parents about it and explaining to them like, wait, how much money are we spending on this vacation? And how much money do the people out there make? And you know they didn't want to. They at the, at the time they they weren't really interested in talking about it. So, like that was like maybe the, one of the first events. But there's a whole host of them that happened. I I moved to Malawi when I was. 23. Uh, mm-hmm. I spent a year working like a corporate job, and then I wanted to do something more meaningful, so I, I moved to Africa. And, I, and when I was over there, I had the chance to go and like do a whole bunch of poverty alleviation work, and and there were a whole bunch of stories from that as well. So it's been these like these gradual moments that have led me to this this mission, as you call it. How did you pick Malawi? I was so, yeah I was I was working a corporate job like the standard corporate nine to five job actually it was more like I tell I tell people it was nine to five but it was more like six thirty a.m. to six thirty it was a really hard uh, like twelve hour day kind of thing and I was working this job I didn't love it and I, and I was learning a lot but I didn't love it and I was making good money and I was being promoted very quickly and all that stuff and I started looking for for something overseas, just anything that I could. And then I was at this wedding, and while I was at the wedding, um, it was June 13th, 2013, sorry, July 13th, 2013, I was, I was a groomsman at my buddy Doug's wedding, and one of the other groomsmen, his name was Woody, he was talking about how he was going to Malawi, and I'd been looking for something overseas, so I said, hey, can you send me some information on that? I'd like to learn more. And he thought I was just being polite or whatever, uh-huh. but I... I was like, no, seriously, please send me information. Like, I, I, that is kind of interesting. So he sent it to me, and um, so that was on July 13th when I that wedding, and then August 13th I was on a, a plane to Malawi. So in that month time frame, I like quit my job, got my shots, packed my things, all that stuff, and, and moved overseas. Yeah, I've got to say, looking at your resume, you move quickly, and this <laughs> yes. this is an example. You don't like to waste time. Yes, definitely. I, I think once you realize this, and I, a lot of times I feel like I, I get pushed. Like I put myself in a situation and then I put myself at the edge of the cliff and then I put myself in a situation where I have no choice but to be pushed off. Um, so like for, that, for example, when I was moving from Malawi, from the America to Malawi, I kind of was like, I started getting to the place where I was like ready to quit and I started telling people, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And I remember telling like enough people that eventually people started saying, do you know Greg's going to Malawi? And at that, at that point, I hadn't actually committed, but I, I, I mean, people just started saying it. So kind of like I was like walking into this reality I was creating. It was kind of weird. Um, but yeah, that, that's what ends up happening. And I really do like moving quickly, that's for sure. Yeah, you've got to know Malawi better than not only most Americans, but better than a lot of people in the world. 
Tell me about them a lot yeah. that you know, and specific people, maybe some challenges or personal victories while you were there. Mm -hmm, sure. So, I mean, it's a it's hard to explain it. I, all, I I usually tell people it's like a completely different planet, right? When if you live in America, you live all the people around you. Uh, some of them are, are richer than you. Some of them are poorer than you. And you look at those people and you think, okay, so I you know I'm like somewhere in the middle. There's a few people richer than me, a few people poorer than me. And you might know, okay, there's, I guess there's people in Africa and they live whatever. And I don't know. It's, it's hard to like really grasp what these people live like, mm -hmm. uh, like the, the type of, of lives that they have. Because we're talking about a country, Malawi, in 2014 and this year, 2017, Malawi is the poorest country on the planet. And people there live on a dollar a day, sometimes 50 cents a day, sometimes they starve to death. I mean, it's, it's like a completely different reality, and it's so hard to put in context for your listeners or for anyone living in America or, or the first world or who, who's never seen anything like that. Sure. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging to, to explain it, but, I mean, it's, it's people living in these rural villages. In, uh, so there's 15 million people in the country. 10 million are these people living in these rural villages. They have no electricity, no, like, running water. A lot of them don't even have access to clean water. Like, they are literally drinking dirty water on a daily basis, and their kids are dying from it, and they're contracting cholera and things like that. Um, they're dying from malaria, from AIDS. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty rough situation. Um, so, on the one hand, material poverty is a very, very bad situation over, the, over there. On the other hand, uh, people in Malawi are just, like, the most welcoming, nice, gentle, loving people that I've ever met. And far they seem far happier than anyone I've, I've ever met in Malawi. They just have, like, a joy and a certain, like, th for the most part, they're fairly, like, stress-free and easygoing and things like that. Um, right. Just, and like, that's way a, more than... than and and that's yeah. in the face of living through massive difficulties that Americans do not have to deal with day-to-day. -day. Yeah. America, an American couldn't imagine. I mean, take, take your average, like, college student and put them in the seat of, uh, like, replace them with some with a Malawian villager and, like, let's see, how, let's see what happens. I mean, it's just, like, it's really, really a completely different world. It's like a different planet. Now, what motivates you to help people? Is it the young you on that trip to Kenya where you just see the, the disparity um, of wealth? Or is it, um, you know, is it, is it more spiritual? Is it religious? That's a good question. And I think... I think it's a combination of several things. Um, and, and like I said, I I feel like I have this kind of path that I'm on, and I'm just trying to follow and be faithful. And I like I'm a Christian, so I do kind of I, I do I like I believe I'm like trying to follow Jesus, and He's mm -hmm. someone who really cared about the poor. Um, but at the same time, when I say I'm a Christian, like most people have this idea in their head of like what a Christian is, and um, and I, most of the time, I I don't think I I probably wouldn't fit like their description because. I'm just like I'm just a little bit different, um, but so there's there's like the spiritual component, but also there's just kind of like this rational component, right? I grew up in Fairfax County, Virginia, and went to private school. Fairfax County, Virginia, if you look it up on Wikipedia, we're the second wealthiest county on the entire planet, mm -hmm. and I grew up there, and I have all of these amazing resources and all the ability to like do so much, and I, when I look at it from completely rational perspective. At the end of my life, what is going to bring me fulfillment? Even like from a selfish perspective, what's going to bring me fulfillment? What's going to make me happy? And if I just like accrue a bunch of money or wealth or cars or whatever it is, all of that stuff, I will not be happy. I mean, that's not, none of those things are going to make me happy. Some like security and comfort, I can see how those things would make you happy, but you don't need a whole lot of money to have those things. And most of the time, you just need a mindset. Um, so, I look at, like, what could I spend my energy on and what's going to bring me happiness and fulfillment? And I, in general, it's, it's helping these people who, who really, really need it. Um, and and it's, just, it's impossible to communicate how badly they, they uh, their, how, how different their lives are, like how, how vastly different their lives are. And uh, with the resources I have and, and the upbringing I had, I, I feel like a certain responsibility to help them just because I'm in a great position to just as most Americans are. And I think, I think it comes kind of from that. Yeah. It's amazing that at 27 years old, you have a sense of what you want your legacy to be. 
Um, yeah, that's really impressive. Now, can you talk a little bit about your unique path? Because I think that you do have a very unique path going to Malawi to teach math, and then you did a whole series mm-hmm. of things. Can you, <laughs> can you condense that, I guess, how you went from one thing to the next <laughs> and how that built? Because yeah. eventually we reach um, Donor C, which is what you're working on now. Right. I've been fortunate to do a whole bunch of different stuff in, in my time. One of the things, and I, I've written a blog about this, is I, I say never repeat a year, right? If, if you're working at a, a desk job and you've, you've learned 85% of, of what you can learn at that desk job, then quit. You find, don't quit, but like move on to something else. Get promoted. Do something else. But like continue learning every single year so that you're not just repeating the same year over and over and over again. Um, so I've, I try to like, I, I, I very consciously try and focus on that now, but I also, um, I think, have been focusing on that for a while. So, yeah, I, I was working at Enterprise Rent a Car, and I quit that, and I moved to Malawi, and I spent a year teaching that. And then I quit that, and I spent a year uh, building up this housing ministry charity where we built houses for orphans and widows in Malawi. Mm-hmm. And the cost of the house is $800, so it's very, very cheap to build these houses. And I tell people, you know, you can build a house for some for a, a real-life person who's homeless for the same price as, like, an iPad right. or a, a nice laptop. Um, so I spent a year doing that, and then the next year... Uh, I did a whole bunch of different poverty alleviations. Like I've, I've worked on any type of poverty alleviation you can think of, housing, uh, sustainable de- development, livestock, agricultural, and then healthcare. But then this last year, I, I, uh, my last year in Malawi, I, I crowdfunded um, $100,000 to build a girls' school. And the reason I did that was because the gender parity gap in Malawi was, is really, really bad. It's very, very, very bad, um, and it's one of. The, I think it's the worst in the world. If maybe, maybe uh, the only place that might be it might be worse is, is certain places in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. But it's really bad, and so we um, we built this girls' school, and it's 100% sustainable. So like we made enough uh, revenues generated from tuition to keep the school afloat. So there's 120 girls going to school um, right now, and I did that, and uh, and and. And that was a big success, and it kind of showed people, uh, it showed a lot of people, you know, there's thousands of people who contributed to that project and got excited about it and heard, heard about it. And so because of that, I was able to kind of take that audience um, that I had developed and, and that following and, and transition it into this, this new app. Um, and the app donor see the whole idea behind it is just to get money directly to people and have uh, the ability for all all donors to get visual updates on whatever they're giving to. So, and, and that, that got started with the, with the school, right? We, what, I, what I do with the school is I show people the building process, the construction process, mm-hmm. and it wasn't like some big charity. I was just using cameras to film, okay, today we're playing on the roof, check it out. And people loved it, and they came back, and they gave several times. And so I, I was watching, as I saw this, I was like, okay, I just built a school. Like, not a big charity built a school. Like, Brett Wire just built a school using his, his friends and his family and, and their following. What if I took these same tools and I put them in the hands of people all over the world, but you don't, we're not just like doing education in Malawi, but what if we fought sex trafficking in Thailand? Or what if we worked in the slums of India? Like, what would that look like? And so that's kind of where donors came from. Wow. So you're really trying to expand geographically. Can you hone in on the specific problem that you saw? Like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with your donor C platform? The, yeah, and there's, you know, it's always a multifaceted thing, um, but I, the, the main problem is this disconnect that, like, when I go on podcasts, I try really hard to explain the, the difference between people in the first world and people in the third world. I mean, I can't do it justice, but I at least want to get, I, I want to plant that, I want to plant that seed. I want people to have the, have the, I want them to be faced with the reality that you, you live a very different life than a lot of other people and you can do something about it. Um, and that reality is not in most people's brain at the moment, right? Most people in America are comparing themselves to other Americans. They wonder if they're Republican or Democrat. They're saying, you know, they think the other person is like trying to destroy. And it's just like there's so many different, there's so many different conflicting things and distracting things. And, and the reality is, as Americans, as people living in the first world, we live such privileged uh, lives. No matter, almost no matter who you are, there's a few people say there's poverty in America. I would challenge that to say, like, the poverty in America is not comparable to the poverty in, like, half of the world. Sure. So that's, that's the main idea with donor is to bring the, the troubles and the plights of the third world into the first world's attention. 
and we do that through video and uh, through um, up, follow-up updates and things like that. And the other thing is, there's, there's, so that's like the main issue, but then there's all these kind of like symptoms that, that go along with it, right? So like some people know that, that there's, that there is sort of real poverty, but they feel helpless to do something about it. But they're not anymore because now that they can download an app and they can literally do something about it seconds after they download it. And some people think, well, I could give to charity, but it's, it's not going to be effective. And they're right because I spent three years living in the third world and I saw how ineffective and inefficient and wasteful and fraudulent most charities were. And then I wanted to create something that wasn't those things. I wanted something that was lean and fast and technologically advanced. And so that donorcy was, was the creation of that. And so people just don't have, I don't, I don't want any, uh, any of those like excuses, like, well, what about this, what about this? No, you can download donors and you can do something in a very efficient, effective, helpful way for people who are, who really do need it. Um, and, and anyone who like downloads the app and starts looking through it kind of sees that immediately. Now, Gret, you're not even talking about the, the telemarketing companies who call me and, you know, they're, they're like barely legit. That's what really infuriates me <laughs> because I know that yeah. 90% of the money is going to the telemarketing firm and like 10% is going to the charity. You're talking about legit, like large charities that have locations around yeah. the world, right? And you think that there's a better way. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly, that's exactly right. So I, and I, you know, that's an unpopular thing to say. People like their, people are often loyal to their charities. They, they like giving to certain places. And I would, you know, it's, it's a shame, but especially when it comes to international charities that are doing international work, a lot of times it's just, they should be embarrassed by how, how poorly the job they're doing because the, there's just like very little accountability and very little transparency. And people talk about, there's these websites like Charity Navigator where you can go and you can see how much money is, is getting to the final destination. But there's, in, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say this, but there are so many ways to manipulate those numbers. So, for example, when I go to, um, like, I, like I said, I ran my own charity two years ago. It's still running today, the housing charity. And, like, when I went to go to uh, buy a roof for the house that we were building, I would go to the guy and I'd say, okay, we, I need the metal sheets for the roof. And he would say, um, well, the sheets are going to cost $300. You, how much do you want me to make the receipt out for? 400 And his idea was basically... He was basically saying, how much money are you going to pocket after you give me the $300 and so that you can report back to the charity that you're working for? Like, you didn't know I was, work, I was working for myself or whatever. And these are kind of like the standard questions, the standard tricks that people use. Uh, to, and this is, that's just like one of, one of a million different things I could share. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a rough situation, and, and there's not very much transparency. And, uh, and that's, that's an issue because the – it's it's not I I don't honestly it's not that big of a deal that donors money isn't being spent well to me it's a big deal that poor people aren't being helped that's the tragedy in my opinion yeah I think what you're talking about in government or public companies that's known as creative accounting but um, you're saying that the yes <laughs> that the beneficiaries are being shortchanged when that happens when it comes to uh, you know doing charitable work out there. Yeah, that's exactly right. How old is DonorC? When did you launch? And how many users do you have today? What kind of activity is there on the platform? Yeah, so I have to be... DonorC is a... Is a we have investors, and I have to be kind of careful with what I share because sure. I used to just share numbers freely, and they got they kind of got on me about that. But DonorC was launched nine months ago, and we are... Doing very well. I don't know how to say. The, I'm not allowed to say the number of users because uh, competition and things like that. But the the thing I, I can share is we're in over 50 different countries at this point. Basically, what we we've had like a, one of those like skyrocketing successes. As soon as we launched, um, there was like a two week period where we were kind of like getting our feet wet, and then we were on we got on our first podcast. It was a the Tom Wood show, and that gave us like a that was a big thing. Gave us a dedicated donor base. And that helped me launch and get on a bunch of other different podcasts, Entrepreneur on Fire, et cetera. We were in National Review, USA Today. I mean, just, we've had like one of those dream experiences. So yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing really well. And the, the one thing I can say is we're in over 50 countries. So. Are all of the projects um, overseas? Outside of the U.S.? 
Um, no, there's there's a couple that are in the U.S., but it's mainly focused on overseas stuff. There there are a few few U.S. based projects. There's some people trying to uh, um, like people will use it to raise money for adoption in the U.S. Uh, so that they can adopt kids, whether overseas or locally. Um, and then there are people that uh, like, for example, there's there's a one guy who was who was paralyzed from the neck down, and donors he was used to help him. Um, so there's things like that. Mm-hmm. Now. How do you work with, um, I guess, on the project side? Do you have to partner with different organizations who are um, handling some of the accountability and overseeing the, uh, I guess, gifting process? How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So um, for the moment, what we do is we just use a trusted network of people. Um, But we're, like I said, we're venture capital backed. So we're using... Uh, we're developing algorithms to auto-generate um, which users are going to be the most trustworthy, uh, and that's going to be dependent on a whole bunch of different factors. And so what you're going to start seeing is when when you, like right now when you load up donor C, you've got the staff pick section and the global section. You can pretty much give anywhere and, and be okay. But in the, um, especially the staff pick section, those are like 100% vetted um, projects. But what we're doing is we're developing this algorithm that's going to help auto-generate. Even if something's not in the staff pick section, you can still know that it's going to be a, a trusted person based on this alg- algorithm that we're making. So, um, yeah, there's a few different uh, there's a few different ways of, of tackling that problem. Is that like an eBay feedback or not? That's going to be that's going to be yeah no that's going to be part of it, but that's not enough because a lot of times you, you know. It's, so, like on e- on eBay, when you order a product um, and it comes to your house and it's like it's fine, you can mm-hmm. give your you can give your review and say oh, I give a positive review to this guy. Um, but that's not enough with the donor relationship because a lot of times it's a donor making a donation to something that's happening in a faraway country and they don't actually they're not actually able to be there. So th- there's going to be more mechanisms in place than just the feedback. But that will be that will be one factor. Yeah, because I imagine that for you and your investors, uh, handling accountability throughout the process is a huge thing. Because um, if you don't monitor, and there, if there are stories that are negative um, or situations right. that didn't work out, that would be detrimental to the platform's success. Exactly. So, and this is this is like we're donors is basically like the two-sided marketplace for humanitarian aid. So every two-side marketplace has to somehow solve this problem. When Uber was, um, when Uber started, they had to solve the problem. How do we get people to trust the uh, the people that they're getting in a car with? Like, you know, how do you get into a stranger's car and trust that? Or Airbnb, how do you stay at a stranger's house and feel safe? And eBay, how do you know that things are going to actually come to you? All, all these different two-side marketplaces have to solve that problem, and they all do it differently. Upwork, Upwork is another great example. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, donor C is going to have its own solution, and it's going to incorporate a lot of the solutions that, that already exist out there. But yeah, that's that's a that's a big thing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Your background is really unique in that you've run a five hundred one c three nonprofit. You've set up donor C as a for profit. Can you talk about mm-hmm. some of the rationale behind that? And because you you've seen firsthand both sides of. Uh, Right, nonprofit and for profit. Yeah, and I I want to be clear that it is possible. It's it's it is definitely possible for a nonprofit to do good work, and and there are nonprofits out, out there that do do good work. So I don't want to make it seem like all nonprofits are bad, but in general, there are a number of different problems with the nonprofit structure. Um, on on a general level, like one of the one of the things that people don't realize is. So donors is in over 50 countries. The only, like, people don't bring up tax exemption a lot. The only country where tax exemption makes a difference for us would be in the U.S., and we're already in 49 other countries. So uh, that becomes, like, not as important. Um, also, uh, depending on what state you live in, up to 80% of the uh, U.S. doesn't line that in their taxes, which means they don't care about tax deduction. And on top of that, we have a lot of companies that, that like to donate to donor fee, right? So, like, a, a company in Cincinnati named Astronomer, they uh, donate once. They all sit around once a month. Or they're a startup, and they all sit around once a month, and they pick out projects, and they donate to them. And then they get, like, videos of 
two things on to saying, thank you, astronomer, for feeding me or, or whatever it is. And um, and that's like a cool company thing. And companies also aren't going to care about the 501c3 uh, tax-exempt status. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why the tax-exempt status is not nearly as powerful as people um, want it to be. And mm-hmm. it, it has its benefits, but it's not it's not as big of a deal. It doesn't affect as many people as you would think. Is your 501c3 homes still still active? Yes, we so, build several houses a month. So you're that. working on both. Just, you're doing both still. Uh, you could say working, but I, the the whole housing thing is completely automated at this point. Like I I don't I don't touch it at all. It's, we have accountants, and I have a person running it in the states, a person running it in Malawi, and I just it, it's not it's not something that affects me. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I'm yeah, I'm 100 percent in on donorcy. So yeah, the um. And then I, I guess, like, the last thing I'll say with the, the nonprofit thing is mm-hmm. there's just, like, a general uh, – there's there are all of these accounting restrictions and legal restrictions which create a lot of friction between uh, money and its use. So, for example, uh, there was this girl in – somewhere in rural Africa who was, like, crossing a river. She got bit by a crocodile, and a local aid worker was able to take a picture of her and say, hey, we need to get medical attention to this girl really soon. A few minutes later, the money was raised for this girl, and she was able to go to the hospital, and her life was saved because of donor seed. And that kind of, like, quick action is not, is not nearly as possible with a nonprofit, uh, in the nonprofit model, because you need there's all sorts of accounting measures and legal stuff, whereas the person who raised the money for the girl, she just had a trusted network, and she was able to do that real quick. And someone's life was saved, and I don't, I don't want to create a situation where, where, um, where it becomes, you know, difficult or taxing to save someone's life or provide clean water for someone or, or something like that. So the whole idea is to reduce as much friction as possible and do things that are in the best interest of the poor. Yeah. So speed is important because donors see. I, it, to me, I see that you're removing the middleman. You're trying to connect the donor to the person in need, and at the same time, you're trying to provide. Uh, transparency, and I think from the donor's side, really an emotional connection to where their money is going. Yes, that's exactly right. Now, can I ask you, to what extent is money important to you? What does money mean to you? Is it a primary concern, or is it just a means to affect positive change in these poor countries that, that you're trying to help? What's your thinking? Money is something, yeah, money is something that, that really scares me. Uh, and I, I mentioned I was a Christian. There's a lot of writing in the Bible about, you know, the just be careful with money, that kind of thing. Um, but even, even beyond that, just common sense, just watching what, how people live their, their lives, watching, you can just watch the progression, right? It's like a bad, it's like a broken record. Every time someone rises to fame and success and wealth, they always, I mean, it's always a bad situation. It almost, there's, there's a few exceptions to this, but most of the time it's like their marriages get ruined, their relationships get wrecked, um, they are less happy, maybe they commit suicide later, and like, it's just really, really a, a dangerous thing that, that people, I mean, there's, people are just like clawing after this, this concept of money, and it's never enough. It's never going to be enough. If, if, uh, if you want to make a million bucks a year, and, and you want to be the guy who's driving a Lamborghini, as soon as you get that, you will still be unhappy. I promise you. Like anyone who, anyone who, uh, if, if you ever have a chance to talk to someone who's truly wealthy, just start asking them these questions. And the thing is, it's, there's a blinding concept to it too, where you you start getting more and more money, and you start thinking, you're, it's, it warps how you appreciate things and how you look at the world and what you feel like the things that are important in life. And most of the things that are important have nothing to do with. With money, so I'm I'm actually like very scared of it, very cautious with it, and and I don't ever want to be in a, in a place where like I've got this mission to help poor people, <laughs> people who are living on like fifty cents a day, you know, or orphans who have literally nothing but like maybe a pair of shorts that they're wearing, like no shirt, no shoes, it just that's all, that's the entirety of, of their possessions, and I I care about those people, and I don't ever want to have the distraction of uh, trying to make money. Um, trying to get like that, the, you know, the next raise or the next whatever. I don't know. I don't know what these things are. So, anyway, to me, money is is, is a is a means to an end, and it's a it's a scary thing that I, I try to be very careful with. It surprises me to hear you say that 
money is scary to you. Really, the focus is you're trying to leverage like one dollar and how can you make the impact as great as possible, right? Right. And it seems like the donor C platform, you're trying to do that like on an international level. You know, you're not just trying to help people in Malawi. You're you're trying to help over fifty countries, uh, the poorest <laughs> yeah. people in the world. And how do you make a big impact? And in countries where eight hundred dollars can build a home, or it doesn't take a lot of me- uh, it doesn't take a lot of money for a medical procedure, the impact can be massive. Yeah, that's and that's the thing. Like it's when you start. Yeah, I think that. You're helping me kind of express <laughs> what I'm thinking but not able to articulate too well yet. But the concern is that I start making enough money where money becomes like the primary focus in my life and I completely lose sight of these other like way more important things. Like, I mean, like every day it's like I could tell you this, these amazing things happen on donors, right? We, we provide clean water for people. Like while I'm recording this podcast with you, I'm watching donations coming through this water project that, I'm, that we have on our site. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have stuff like this all the time. And, yeah, I don't want to lose sight of that. I mean, these are real people. There's, like, this, this one village. There's a 1,000 people living in this, in this village. They don't have clean water. In January, this little girl named Chisomo died because of, of the clean water that wasn't in their village. And it is, like, if, if you could have this, the spare time to sit and think for 30 seconds about this little girl who she got, she was she's just trying to drink water, and she couldn't, and it was making her sick, and she kept throwing up, and she kept getting sicker and sicker. And if you've ever been, like, uncomfortably sick in your life, if you ever had food poisoning or anything like that, that's what this little girl went through night after night until eventually she died and her parents had to bury her. And then her parents had to return to the water source that killed their daughter. So these are like the types of things that I care about fixing in the world and I don't want to get distracted by, by money. I, I think that money is a good thing and it's a tool and all that, all that stuff that's, that's really obvious that people will throw out there when they hear me say this. But the, the, the thing I'm trying to get across, about, like I care way more about this mission I'm on than, than about making the next milestone, the next, the next digit on my bankroll. Yeah, when you have these missions, and like, what do you think is really motivating you, and how does it make you feel? Like, what makes you happy? <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think it's empathy. I think it's my... Uh, I do think I have an unusual ability to put myself in other people's shoes. Um, it's, it's like, for example, that, that story of the little girl I just told. Like, I've actually... I mean, there's this, there's this, I wrote this blog a few weeks ago kind of expressing that there was this one night when I just, like, couldn't help but thinking about this little girl, Chisomo, and I just, I, I kind of, like, I, I was putting myself in her position, and I was realizing, oh, my gosh, she, she was, this girl was tortured, and I was, I was able to actually, like, put myself in her frame of reference. And so I think, on the one hand, I experience a lot of sorrow from these things. Like, I, 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 I do get kind of sad uh, when, I, when I think about what's going on in the world, but there's also, like, a tremendous amount of hope um, when it comes to uh, what we're able to do for them. And, and I, I get a lot of grat- gratification in that. Like, I love um, when I'm able to do something for someone else. And, I've, and to me, like, every time I've given away money, even in the times when money's, like, really tight, every time I've given it away, it's always been to someone who needs it way more than I do. And it's always, I've never, like, regretted it. I've never been like, oh, that was dumb. Why did I do that? Why did I give away money to a poor person? Like, I've never thought that. I've always been like, man, I'm so glad I did that. That was an awesome experience. What, what a cool thing I was able to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel that, and, I, and that's the type of experience I hope to provide for other people through, through the donors of the app. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is that when you do give it away, even when, even if you don't have that much, I think that there's a tendency that it comes back to you either in the gratitude or gratification that you feel as the donor or for your platform, you know, the word spreads and the thing grows and the, it comes back to you in more donations so that you can do more. I just have one last question for you. Um, like, where do you see donor C? What does it look like five years from now, 10 years from now? How do you measure success? My goal right now, I want everyone in America to have the experience that I'm talking about where you're like able to give, even if it's like five bucks, one dollar, whatever it is, the experience of like giving to someone who's in need and seeing the impact that you can make on their life. Everyone should have that experience. It's a really powerful thing and it's something I, I want the whole world to share in. Um, but like especially everyone in America, so I, I want donors to become a household name. Like everyone just knows about it and is using it. 
um, all over the world and especially in America to kind of help um, as, as like a main donor base. I really want that to happen and anything I can do to like get on podcasts or um, get press or anything like that, I, I always look for those opportunities because it's, it's a chance for me to kind of, um, it, it's a chance for me to kind of bring the third world into, uh, into view for the first world. Um, so that five years from now, donors is a household name. Um, Ten years from now, I want to have a really developed, robust platform that's kind of like YouTube or Netflix where um, you go to DonorC and you can just give in any way you want to give. You can show up and you can use the search bar. You can use different categories and you can say, if, if you want to give to a – if you want to provide hearing for a deaf girl in China who's an orphan, you can just type all that in. A bunch of projects will come up. You'll be able to measure the impact of all of those different people. You'll be able to see, like, oh, these are – these projects – will have this amount of impact that's very track uh, that's very trackable and has like a whole history and feedback score and trust score and all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of the, the long term vision is like this really robust platform where you can pretty much give any way you want in the most gratifying way possible. Yeah, there are a lot of there's certainly a lot of people out there who need help. So um, a lot of runway oh, for yeah. growth. Yes, that's the thing. Like, people have no idea how many people are suffering in the world. Like I said, you look at the other people in your neighborhood or the other people you work with, and you think, oh, I'm not as rich as that guy, but I'm, I'm richer than that guy. But no, half of the world lives on a dollar a day, two dollars a day. So um, there's there's a lot there's a lot that that, that can be done to, to for us to play our part. For sure, my my family experienced that firsthand back in 2000 visiting Cambodia. Um, one, hearing the Very family cool. histories and the difficult things that they went through, uh, but then seeing the children on the street, and uh, I was just so impressed with them, because not only were they, you know, they're trying to sell postcards and raise money for their families, but they're really entrepreneurial. They would speak, an English-speaking tour group would come through, and they'd be speaking to you mm -hmm. in English. Then I'd see, like, a German-speaking yeah. tour group, and they know enough German to <laughs> tell them, you know, remember me, sir, yeah. can, when you come back, can you buy a postcard from me? I and love that. Yeah. the coolest thing was, I think, similar to what you experience in Africa, is that the kids that I saw there were just genuinely happy, really good kids, because after the tour groups would come through, I would just see them playing together and laughing, and um, there was a genuine happiness there. Uh, but on the yeah. other hand, there's there's a lot of need and a tremendous potential uh, for people to help the families. And a dollar makes, a, I think, a far bigger impact in some of these countries than in our hometowns. That's one of the things that's hard to, hard to communicate. But yeah, a dollar really does go a long way. Gret, where can the Inspired Money listener find you? Find uh, they can you find me on Twitter. And that's at Greg Lyer, G R E T G O Y E R. And if you download the Donor C app and you type in my name, Greg Lyer, then you'll be able to follow me on Donor C as well. We have a mechanism where you can follow people. And I post projects all the time from all sorts of different countries that I'm working on, Haiti, Malawi, et cetera. So, yeah, those are the, those are the two best ways to do it. That's awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for your time, sharing your passion for helping the poor, uh, creating a platform uh, of inspired money and enabling people to make their money more inspired. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. There was so much great stuff that Gret spoke about and is doing. What was your favorite inspired money moment? Three that I picked are money cannot buy happiness. In the developed world, material goods like a Lamborghini doesn't guarantee fulfillment. Gret's description of Malawi reveals people who have happiness and joy, even in the face of extreme poverty. Then did you pick up what Gret said about putting himself at the edge of a cliff, and then in a position where he can only get pushed off? He called it walking into the reality that you're creating. I really loved that. Accountability helps you take bigger steps than you might take alone. And then Gret's fear of money was interesting. He mentioned risk of succumbing to greed in developing work priorities. He implied that a simpler life might be a better path. Perhaps the biggest thing Gret is telling us is that you and I can make a difference. Gret is putting an app in our hands to increase the impact of our money, to help real people. Whether it's building a home, providing clean water, 
underwriting somebody's medical procedure, it's definitely worth checking out Donor C. That's D O N O R S E E. And their tagline is Give Directly, See Impact. So check it out. And now, coming up in the next episode of Inspired Money. At that time, did that blow your mind when Susan Sarandon comes to your apartment for, to play ping pong? Or, or did that just become normal to you? No, I mean, she's incredible. Obviously, it's, you know, it's nice to meet people that you admire. Um, so yeah, I was, I, was, I was very excited to meet her. And uh, we became good friends and she, she, she's truly incredible. Check out the next episode of Inspired Money. That's Frank Raharinozi, co-founder of Spin, a growing global brand of ping pong social clubs with venues in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Toronto, and maybe a city near you. Oscar award-winning Susan Sarandon is among his business partners. Thank you for tuning in. If you liked today's show, the best thing you can do is to subscribe, rate, and review us. Go to inspiredmoney.fm right now where there's a link for you to leave an iTunes review. You'll also find show notes and guest links. Inspired Money is brought to you by my company, Runnymead Capital Management, a fiduciary investment advisor that helps businesses, individuals, and families with financial planning and investment management. Educate yourself for free by subscribing to our blog at blog.runnymead.com. That's R-U-N-N-Y-M-E-D-E. All the music on today's show is by Jim Kimo West. Want to be an inspired moneymaker? Do something that scares you. Do something that's going to make you better. Do something to give back in a bigger way to the world. Tweet me what you're doing. Until next time, find your inspiration and run with it.